Hi, it's Emily Williams. I'm the founder of I Heart My Life and your host of the I Heart My Life show. And this is episode 47. Today's guest is David Nagel. He's someone who's very special to me, and he's an income acceleration mentor and best selling author. He's someone I haven't yet worked with personally, but I feel like I have. <laughs> about five years ago, I worked with one of his students, Gina DeVee. And about two years ago, I worked with Marla Mattinson, who also was trained by him. And so I feel like through the grapevine, David and I have a very long relationship. James and I are also super fans of his podcast, The Successful Mind Podcast, and we devour it. And I highly recommend after you listen to this episode, go and check that out. So one of the things that David is known for that we talk about today is helping people turn their yearly income into their monthly income. I remember my coach, Gina DeVee, telling me that this was possible when I was first starting out. And I didn't believe her, but I liked the sound of that. (laughs) So David and I talk about how you go about turning your yearly income into your monthly income. We also talk about his journey from making $20,000 a year up to multi-millions just in a short space of time, how he was able to make that happen and how he recommends you do the same in your life and business. I know that this episode is going to be hugely transformational to you. So I recommend putting everything aside, giving this your full attention, taking notes and coming back and listening again and again. So without further ado, this is episode 47 with David Nagel. Hey, everyone, it's Emily Williams here, the founder of I Heart My Life and your host of the I Heart My Life show. Now, I know I say this every single week, but the guest we have today is so special. As you've already heard, David Nagel is someone who has greatly inspired my own journey and impacted my success at I Heart My Life and, and personally. So I'm thrilled to have him here with you today because I know a lot of our listeners have heard me talk about him, talk about his podcast and his work. But for some of you, his story is probably going to be a little bit new. So we are going to go ahead and dive right in. Welcome, David. Thanks, Emily. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. I'm so excited. You, like I said, are one of those people I admire so much, and you've impacted me in many, many ways. Uh, One of the ways in which you have impacted me is showing me that anything is possible. And you've done that through sharing your story, through your sharing your journey. And now I'd love for our listeners to really get to know you better. So can you take us back to where you were at the start. And what I mean by that, I know we have a a lot to catch up on, but the start before the accident, the life that you were living, and the way that you were brought up, because I feel like it really um, helps us to to compare where you are now today. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Well, so it was an it was an interesting um, childhood, to say the least that there I was born in 1966. And uh, there was a, a real bad traumatic accident that happened in 1970 in my family that I, I believe was a pivot point for my entire family, meaning my grandparents, my mother and father, um, my brother, and some extended uh, family also. And that was that my uncle, my mom's brother, and his two children died in a house fire. And... Uh, Prior to this happening, the fa- the family was I mean they were they were okay right like they had dysfunctions like any other family did but but everything was pretty was pretty normal they had lived in the same house for twenty two years there was no instability there was no divorce you know everything was was pretty good after that tragedy happened it really shook I think the psychology and the emotional psychology of the family to its core. And I don't think they had the um, the emotional or psychological skills to deal with it. So it started bringing up all of these hidden issues in everyone. And nobody was really getting help for anything. And it started to just spiral and spin completely out of control. Um, by the time I was 21 years old, I had moved like 22 times. So we went from living in the same house for 22 years. Well, I didn't. I mean, I wasn't even born yet, but my mother did, to constantly moving all over the place. Uh, My grandparents also. And it was like this subconscious search for their lost son in a way or something weird like that. I mean, um, 
it, it really turned into a, a crazy situation. And then my parents got divorced when I was 13. Uh, my father uh, live, was living in Arizona and I was living with my mother and my brother in Chicago. My mom kind of went off the deep end a little bit for about three years and was really gone. Like she worked and then she went out every night and I never saw her for, for three years. When I did, it was not a pleasant experience. She was really not in a good place. So it, I was pretty much raising myself and my brother for that period of time. And then when she started to come back around again, when I was about 17, we had a big blowout and I ended up leaving home. So I quit high school. I left home. I was working. Um, uh, I, I was doing a lot of different things, trying to find my way and uh, did, even did a stint in the army for about a year, then came out of there, uh, started, a, a thought that a brilliant idea would be to start a family. <laughs> <laughs> And I got married, had two children, and quickly started to realize that I was taking on more responsibility in my life than I actually had the ability to be responsible for. I was working on a dock. Uh, but I was basically working two jobs. I would work on a dock with all the overtime that they would give me during the week. At, it was a night job. And on the weekends, I would drive a truck uh, all around the Midwest. And I was me. I couldn't. I could not get my income over twenty thousand a year. It was. It was a really bad situation. We were living next door to a drug dealer. Um, we were. We actually went uh, on food stamps for about seven, eight months, as I remember it. You know, like getting government cheese and peanut butter. And I would come home every day, and I would look at this situation, and I would think, "What the hell?" Like. How did I end up here? I mean, this was even, I was not raised, you know, that close to poverty. Um, my family was working class, lower middle class. And I here I am, I'm doing worse than, than even they were. Um, and I, I didn't understand why. So, the, you know, then I had the accident in September of 1989 and the, the thing that that did was it, it really kind of woke me up to the idea that there's an urgency to life. And if I was going to make a change, I needed to do it now because it gave me, I think it gave me the perspective that a lot of people get, but only like when they grow really old and they're ready to die and they look back at their life and they can either look back at it and say, yeah, that was a, a life well lived, or they can look back and regret I had the ability uh, in 1989 to look back at my short life at that point and see nothing but regret. Like I, if I had died that day in September, I would literally have left my my wife and kids with um, nothing but problems. And Yeah, I just want to pause there for one second. And I love everything that you've shared. And I know we're going to go deeper into this. And um, I think that it's so powerful thinking about this wake up call that you had and just to give the audience a little bit more information. So you and your wife, I believe, were on a boat on a lake and you got sucked into a dam, correct? On the Illinois River, actually. OK. Yeah. And I, we went so that so my son was born in June of 89. He was very colicky. And I was working a ton of hours. My wife was working part time and and with our son and we weren't getting any sleep. And we, and we were just at our wits end at that point because we were he our son was only sleeping like an hour a day. I mean, it was it was wow. it was horrible. It was those horror stories that you hear about, like a, a sick child. So. Uh, my mom really saw that we were like at the edge <laughs> where we were going to snap. And she said, listen, why don't you get your sister-in-law to watch the kids? We're going out on your uncle's boat this weekend. Why don't you come with? You can water ski. You know, we're going to have good food and wine and, you know, stuff like that. And I, and we were like, yes, that's exactly what we need. We need just a, a, a day off away from everything, you know, to kind of just, you know, recharge. And so that's what we did. We, we met them down in Marseille, Illinois, which was about 100 miles from my house. Um, and we got on this boat and we went up the river for, I don't know, an hour or two uh, to this place where I didn't know where we were. I had never been there before. Um, and I didn't know that we were close to a dam. I knew there was a dam there, but I didn't know that we were anywhere near it. And actually, we weren't really that close. We were about a mile away from it. 
um, what had happened was that the week before we were there, it had rained all week. And the, the river was high and it had a really swift current going, but it was wide. So it wasn't like a raging current. It was just strong and steady. So the top of the water looked like glass almost. It, it didn't look like it was dangerous at all. And I got separated from the boat and they couldn't get me in time. And before I knew it, I got sucked through that dam. Wow. And I know that you had a lot of injuries, excuse me, and they were surprised that you even survived, correct? I was only one of two people at that point since the dam had been there that survived and they had people go through it every year and died. There was like if you were in a boat and, and it's a river, so it has a current, right? If you were in a boat on that river above the dam and your motor went out, you had no way to stop the boat from being sucked through the dam. There was no cable that ran across the river. Um, you're not, you're not, if the river, if the dam is open and there's that much current flowing through, you're not going to paddle your way to the shore. So there was nothing to stop a boat from going through it. And when I do live seminars, I show a picture of this huge tugboat in the 1940s that got pinned up against the dam because its engines went out and it, the dam, that, that river and the dam turned it into toothpicks. The, wow. the year before I went through it, there were two guys that had a little motorboat. They were out fishing on the on the river. Their boat, their uh, their engine went out. Their motor went out. They couldn't get to shore. The, the they got sucked into the dam, but their bodies didn't come out the other side. So they sent three firefighters down with scuba gear to get them out, and all five died. So oh goodness. yeah, yeah. It, it was a it's a very very dangerous dam. And I hear now that they've changed it and they actually have a cable that runs across the river. But it took them like. 25 years to do that. So, wow. I, yeah, I was one of two people that went through it that survived. And I heard that the other person that went through it was like a paraplegic. Goodness. And, and that story just makes me think of how we all have those moments in time, or at least those of us who have moved through, um, have those moments in time where our whole life changes course. And I know that that was the moment for you. So can you tell all the listeners a little bit about what transpired after that? You said you had a bit of a wake-up call around your life previous to that point. So what was next? Well, you know, it was was interesting, Emily, because when I went through this dam and I came out the other side and everybody was making a really big fuss about this. Um, I was on the radio. I had a few interviews that I was asked to do. Everybody was asking me, how did I survive it? And it wasn't like I really did anything. Like I really attribute my survival mostly to the fact that I had a life vest on. Um, that That's what brought me to the surface when I was just about to pass out underwater when I came out the other side. Uh, I did do a couple things. Like I grabbed onto a branch. I, I fastened my life vest to this branch until a boat could, could get me out of the water. But Outside of that, it was really it was really more attributed to the life vest. But anyway, they're making this big deal out of it. And they're telling me about all these people that died and only one person lived. And I start thinking to myself, huh, there must be a reason that I survived this. Like, did God save me? Is there is there something I'm not seeing? Like, I started asking the question, like, why did I survive this? And so many people did not survive it. And I didn't have, like a lot of people feel survivor's guilt when they go through an accident and other people die and stuff. I didn't, I wasn't experiencing that. I was experiencing more of a sense of purpose, but an unknown purpose. So I started looking around me in some weird way, trying to figure out what, wonder what this means. Like I was trying to give meaning to something that I didn't know how to give meaning to. And then I'm what, so then I start to like um, superstitiously start to think that all of a sudden something is going to change because I had this experience. I mean, I didn't understand anything back then. Uh, So the time is going on and I find myself still working on the dock. I heal. I go back to work. I'm in the same position I was before. It's getting worse. I'm getting angrier. I'm getting more frustrated. I'm getting more exhausted. And one night I just had this emotional meltdown in the back of a, a trailer at work And I was just crying. I was just sobbing in the back of this trailer sitting on a forklift. And I was like begging God to please show me what I need to change. How do I turn this around? Because, you know, the the way when I would ask for help, people would would basically say to me, well, you shouldn't have quit school. 
And I was like, yeah, that's great. I got that. I, I got that message very loud and clear. What do I do now? Because I have a family. I have financial responsibilities. Uh, I don't have enough money to go to school. I don't have the time to go to school. This was before the internet. There was no taking classes online. How do I how do I change it around? And, and people couldn't tell me. So I'm basically begging God to tell me, how do I change this? And I, that night, a voice, a loud voice, I swear it seemed outside of me. I know it had to come from inside, but it, it really seemed almost like it was audible. It said, change your attitude. And I started thinking to myself, no, nah, that can't be. It, like, could that really make a difference? If I And if it, if it would make a difference, what about my attitude do I have to change? I really didn't even understand what an attitude was. So... I did a little thinking. I used somebody that I could compare to me that was actually very successful. And it's, it just so happened to be the owner of the company that I was working for. And I knew he, <clears throat> his story was pretty famous. He had built the largest food importer company in the United States. And he started it in his garage. And he came from a working class family. And I thought, okay, I can relate to this guy on that level. What's the difference between his attitude and mine? And I thought, well, he must love what he does because he built something from his garage to this, you know, multi-million dollar uh, empire. He must have really done good at it. So um, I realized that I didn't love what I did and I was I was not doing a good job for my employer at all because I hated what I did. So I thought, okay, so he loves what he does. He does it to his very best. And then and then I, I remember seeing him walk around like every so often he would come in with other companies and he would show them this warehouse that they had, you know, mechanized and everything to do all this incredible stuff. And they would show them, you know, what it was that they created. And he would always stop like if he wouldn't he would not walk past you without stopping and saying hello. And I thought he really treats people with respect and I do not. So I changed those three things. I started showing up to work, acting like I love what I did, doing every job to my best of my ability, and treating everybody with respect. And my plan was to try this for a year and see if anything changed. I did not know that in 30 days, my whole life was going to then take an an enormous change for the better. And that's where uh, in 30 days, I did something that, that I became aware of something that allowed me to triple my income. And to do it immediately. And I was so shocked at the fact that here I am struggling for years trying to figure out how do I just get to 40,000 a year? And I went from 20,000 to 62 in 30 days. I'm like, okay, there's something to this changing my attitude. There's something to what I did. Everybody around me was telling me, no, it's just luck. You know, don't screw this up like you've screwed everything up. Do a good job. Stay with this company forever. It's a good company. And I'm thinking, no, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to do a good job, but I need to find out what the hell I did. Because if I can figure that out, I know I'm on the right track and there's no telling what I could accomplish. So that's when I went into a period of about seven years of study, going to seminars, reading books, um, reading uh, or mostly listening to books. Actually, I read a lot of books, but I was also listening to books because I used to drive 100 miles to work one way. So I used to get books on tape and and lectures on tape and all, all that kind of stuff. And I basically turned my car into a library that for, you know, uh, 90 minutes twice a day, I would just study. So Slowly but surely, everything began to improve and turn around in my life. And then after seven years, I realized what my calling was, what I was really good at. And I started a company uh, in October of 1999. That was 20 years ago, basically yesterday. And congratulations. Thanks. And 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 that's what it's been, uh, you know. Yeah, I love your story so much. And there's so much to unpack there. And I specifically love the piece around basically tripling your income, because I know that you had this belief system and this mindset passed down from family and society that 20000 a year was what people made. It was difficult to make more than that. And I know that a lot of us also have this belief that it's all about hard work. But actually, you were working six and a half days a week and not able to make ends meet. And I think it's Steve Seibold who says that if the secret to financial success was hard work, then all of the waitresses and construction workers in the world would be rich. Yeah. Right. And so we know it's not just about hard work. So 
Can you share with the listeners? I know that it was a change in perspective. It was a change in attitude. But was it a new awareness around an opportunity that enabled you to shift your income that drastically? It was because the opportunity that was around me had been around me for two years. I was aware of it. And now, number one, I didn't know what it paid. Um but I never even considered going to work for this company. And it was a direct delivery petroleum company. The reason that I knew about it was because one of the drivers used to come to our warehouse and fuel all the trucks and all the refrigerated trailers because our trucks carried food. So we had about 100 tractor trailers that needed fuel in the trucks and in the trailers twice a week, every Tuesday and Thursday. And this guy, Drew Batty from Whiting, Indiana, he would he would come and, and I would have to make sure that the right stuff got filled. Um, and when it got when it got filled, that that uh, I signed off on his ticket. We And we developed a friendship over a period of, of two years. And, and one day he said to me, uh, he said, you, you don't really want to stay working here, do you? And I was like, no, I don't. He said, why don't you come to work for us? And immediately I started making fun of him. I, and I was like. Your job sucks. You always smell like diesel fuel. You're out in the rain. You're out in the snow. You're out in the heat. You're out when it's, you know, 20 below zero. Um, And I said, and you're driving a bomb. Like, who the hell wants to drive a truck that's carrying fuel? It's a freaking bomb on wheels. That's that's absolutely crazy. And then I said to him, I said, answer me this, Drew. Like, I was, I was, I was so cocky and arrogant, Emily. It was crazy. I'm like, answer me this, Drew. Has anybody ever died driving one of those things in your company? He's like, like yeah. Two years ago, a guy rolled one and burned to death. And I'm like, see, there you go. There's the exact reason why I don't want to come to work for you, right? And he said, how much do you make? I said, about 20 a year. I said, how much do you make, dude? And he's like, well, last year I made 50. And I'm like, you're full of shit. And he said, next week when I come, I'll bring out a check stub. So he did. And he showed me. And I was like, th- that spun my head around because I actually thought he made less than me. I, I mean, I was so arrogant. It was unbelievable. I didn't know anything. Uh, arrogant and naive. And mm-hmm. um I was like, okay, that that caused a real pause in my mind for a minute. I thought, wait a minute, this guy's doing this and he's making almost three times as much as I am. Uh, maybe I should look into this. So I, I was scared. I was afraid to leave where I was going. I knew that if I went to this new company, I'd be the bottom of seniority. Uh, that would mean that during their slow time, I had a chance of being laid off. There were people that got laid off every year. And I was going in, I was, I was going to be hired at a time when layoffs would start in about two months. So I started working there in, in October and in their biggest part of their business was actually fueling construction uh, equipment around Chicago. But when the ground freezes in Chicago, constru- construction comes to a halt. So the only thing that they have to carry them through the winter months is fueling trucking companies and the, and the railroad. So they had just gotten Union Pacific Railroad um, when it became the largest railroad in the world. And that's when I got hired there. And and because they had so much railroad business, um, it kept me working all that winter. And I would manage to climb up high enough in seniority by the next year that I never did get laid off. So Incredible. Yeah, I love that. And I think it's such a good reminder for me as well, because I did the same thing when I moved to London. I was in this place of feeling so um, confused about what the next step was, feeling like nothing was happening. And I remembered hearing Oprah Winfrey talk about gratitude journals. And I was like, okay, just just like you, I said, I'll give this a try for a little bit and see if anything changes. And it really shifted everything because I was no longer focused on what wasn't working, but I was focused on what was. And just that shift in perspective that shift in energy really changed so much for me. And it sounds like that was the same for you. It's that shift in attitude and an opportunity that had been there all along was now something that you were made aware of and you were more open to. And it sounds like you probably transformed your relationship or your perspective on the person who offered you the job as well and saw it in a different light. Yeah, absolutely. And the great thing about the new job was they didn't know the old me. They only knew Ah, the person that I had changed into. So that person had a fantastic attitude. 
worked really worked really hard, did every job to their best of their ability. I there was nothing that I gave them a hard time about. They were a union company, so they were very used to getting a lot of pushback by the union employees. And I had to I had to become union to join this company. And I'll never forget uh, somebody said to me, when you go to work for this company, what's your goal? And I'm like, what do you mean? What's my goal? I don't have a goal. Like, I'm going to go to work. And they're like, no, what's your, like, where do you want to go in the future? And I said, I hadn't really thought about it. And they, and they said to me, what you want to do is you want to work really hard and get yourself into management. He's, and they said, but if you hang around all of those union people, you're going to have the wrong mentality to get into management and you're never going to get promoted out of being uh, doing whatever the union members do. He said, stay away from the union people. He said, it's not that they're bad people. They just don't want to go anywhere. They, they, they're very happy doing what they're doing. So I remembered that because when I went to work there, it was true. It was, they were, it was a very negative environment and very much like the, the, the companies against the employee type of a, a mentality. And I stayed away from that and I would do any job that the company would give me and I would do it better than anybody else. So I was the first person outside of the family who owned that company to ever get promoted out of being a driver into management. And then in a few years, I was not only in charge there, but I, I had been given, I, have, I had been uh, promoted to the person that was in charge of expanding the company across the country. And when I, it was right after I got that promotion, I realized how good I actually was. And that's when I quit and started my own business. Wow. And I know your story, I think like the back of my hand at this point, because James and I listen to your episodes all the time. But I'm curious to know, when did the Tony Robbins event happen? 1993. Okay. So six years before you started the business. Are you able to share that story with the audience? I think it's so powerful. Yeah. So when I went to work for this company, basically what happened was I had written down three goals, three things that I wanted, and I had accomplished two of them. Actually, there were four things. I, but I had accomplished three of them uh, in a year. And that was, well, the first thing was to increase my income to 40000 So I went to sixty two immediately. The next thing was to buy a house um, and, and move into a good neighborhood. So I accomplished that within the first year. The, the, the next thing after that was I wanted my own fishing boat because I grew up fishing when I was a kid and I wanted, a, I wanted a decent fishing boat. Like that was a dream. I thought maybe in 20 years I might be able to get something like that. I had that with like a year, a year, year and a half, something like that. So I had those things and I was still studying relentlessly. And I, I remember there was this one night I came home and I didn't know where to get information. I didn't know what direction. I didn't know that there was a self-improvement business development section at the bookstore or in a library. I didn't know that. I stumbled across it. But I came home one night and Tony Robbins was doing his infomercials with Fran Tarkenton, the personal power uh, infomercials, when he was first starting out with those. And it took me three nights to convince myself to spend the 160 bucks and buy them, but I did. And I started listening to those religiously. And it was basically like turn your life around in 30 days type of a cassette program. You set goals and, and all that. And in there was a $100 coupon to go to one of his live events. And the live event cost $3,600 and it was in Ohio in February. And mm-hmm. I remember I remember thinking to myself, I really want to go to this, but I don't have $3,600. And, and I was talking about this with my wife and she's like, well, go. She's like, it, you know, if you really want to go, go. She's like, you just got to come up with $3,600. And I'm having this conversation with her in our kitchen and I'm looking, I'm having a, drinking a cup of coffee and I'm looking out the kitchen window and I'm staring at my boat. And all of a sudden it dawns on me, there's my $3,600. I just paid, paid this boat off. If I, if I sell the boat, I will, I will have the money to go. And I'm like, no, you, <laughs> like really that's like that's my opportunity right there I got to I got to sell this boat that I just worked really hard to get and I and I and I thought to myself you know what if I ever figure out what I'm doing I'll be able to buy any boat that I want so I sold it that week and I bought the tickets to go and that's how I ended up uh uh going to a Tony Rob my first Tony Robbins event going to my first event period 
I love that story. And one of the reasons why is because you often talk about how in order to move forward or, or in order to gain something, sometimes we have to lose something or give something up. So can you talk a little bit about that shift that you had to make and that you see your clients often making? Because I know one of the things that you are known for is helping people turn their yearly salary into their their monthly income. So can you talk a little bit about making that shift? Yeah. So, the, you know, as I as I started to study, I started to like between reading and, and coaching with people, I started to learn all of these really cool ideas that that helped me make sense out of what happened to me, how I became, uh, how I started to become successful. And basically what my mentor told me was that I became an unconscious competent. Uh, I was doing things the right way, but I didn't know what I was doing. And he said to me, you know, the danger of that is that if something changes external of yourself, you don't know what to change in order to adapt to that change. So very often unconscious competence are winning one day, but losing the next when something changes. So one of the things that I learned was the law of sacrifice, which basically means letting go of something of a lower nature in life in order to gain something of a higher nature. And I recognize that's what I did with the boat. I was willing to let go of something of a lower nature. Like I could have kept the boat. I could have enjoyed the boat, but that, but, but that would have not gotten me any further in life. It would have brought me pleasure, but it wouldn't have gotten me any further in life. So it became an asset at that point. And I was willing to let that go to gain more knowledge, to pay for the knowledge that I needed that would allow me to go further in life. And that, you know, when I started my business, uh, I was, I came out of the gate in the, in the, in my business earning the equivalent of about $50,000 a year. And I realized that uh, I wanted to do what I was being taught, which was to turn your annual income into a monthly income. So I decided that I was going to give this a shot. And I worked at it for three months. And the first two months, I failed miserably at it. And my mentor said to me, he said, David, it's easier to make $50,000 a month than it is to make $50,000 a year. And I thought he was just screwing around with me because he used to do that all the time. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it's easier for you. You know, not it's not easier for me. It's easier for you. <laughs> and so I said that to him the first month. And then the second month, I talked to him at the end of the month. And he said, how did you do? And I'm like, I still didn't do it. Like, I don't know. I'm missing something. He said, I told you it's easier to make $50,000 a month than it is to make $50,000 a year. Now, my mentor was an interesting guy because – He never really told you how to do anything. What he forced you to do was to learn how to think because that's the thing that you could take with you forever. If you really understand how to think successfully, that's yours for for life. If I always tell you what to do, you're not learning how to think. Then everybody needs to tell you what to do in order for you to do something. So I thought, okay, he's telling me it's easier. And I was like, oh, he literally means it's easier. What am I doing that's not easy about? That? I'm making this hard. And I realized at that moment, this value that I had clung to that worked for me so well for several years um, of hard work was now getting in my way of actually in, of actually doing this seemingly magical thing of turning your annual income into a monthly income. And I thought, okay, so if I'm going to make this easy, what would be the easiest way based on what my business is for me to do this? And I thought, well, if I charged $50,000 for one client, I could do it immediately. But I didn't really believe that I could do that yet. So I readjusted the math. And I realized when I did that, that the math that I had had chosen, like there must have been a blind spot there because there's no way that the numbers ever would have worked. I, I mean, I would have had to work myself to death to ever make the numbers in a, in a, enough numbers in a month in order to get to 50,000. It, it just... Based on the resources that I had at the time, it was not possible. So I, I increased my price of a different product and I did it in two weeks. It didn't, wow. take, it didn't take me a month. It took me two weeks and I never went backwards after that. That changed. That was like the final thing that really shifted for me. Like, oh, earning money actually is easy when you stop thinking about it from the, from the, the ethic of working hard 
so that you you don't put you don't make what you're doing difficult. It's not that we still don't work hard, but I'd like to say we work diligently, right? A lot of yeah. hard, a lot of hard work. What what ends up happening is a person looks at every project that they do, and instead of figuring out how to, how to do it easier and faster, they figure out how to do it hard. So that's what changed. And from there, I went over a million, and then it was multiple millions, and then the company was global. And it, you know, I really took that with me and everything else that I was doing. How do we actually make this easier and leverage what we have instead of making it hard and having it take forever? And then. I became really well known for helping my clients do that so that, you know, most of them would go over seven figures within 12 months. So amazing. Yeah, I was one of the of the people who benefited from all of your story and your journey of making that happen. Because I remember my mentor, Gina DeVee, who worked with you, yeah. told me the same thing. She said, well, you can turn your annual salary, which wasn't very much at the time, into your monthly. And I thought she was crazy, just like you did. But I like the sound of that. And so I thought I would give it a try. And I think that it's so important the way that you describe this, because you also had to look at your company at the time and the vehicle that you were operating in, so to speak, to see if it was actually possible to do what you were saying you wanted to do. And of course, we operate with the belief that anything is possible, but we also need to look at the company itself and what you've already created and make tweaks. So can you talk a little bit about how somebody in maybe a current situation could look to see if their company is ready to go to the next level? And if not, one of the ways that they can make an adjustment? Yeah. So one of the things to do is to, you know, you have to ask yourself, first of all, what is the goal that you want? And with goals, you have to be really careful because a goal is not only does it give your life direction because you can set a goal in any area of your life, but you should be setting goals that you've never accomplished before. But the problem is that people do one of two things. Either they set a goal that they know that they can achieve because it is some version of something that they've done before, that no growth is required, and they have this intention to get further along, but they never do. So they're setting an incorrect goal. But then on the other side, you'll have people that will set a goal that's outside of their own belief system. So that's like when I was making 20000 a year, if I just said, I want to make $10 million this year. I never would have hit 10 million. It would have never happened because I didn't really believe I could do it. It was a wish and a hope. It was like a bet on a lottery ticket type of mentality. So what a person needs to do is they need to say, what do I, what do I really want? And then take the number if they want to increase their income and say, okay, what do I really believe that I could, that I could receive if I, if I was to ask for it? And, and that's both in transaction size and the overall monthly amount or the or annual amount. What number can you see yourself really making? And then you start there. Then you have to look at, your, at the resources that you have within your company. That's the products or services that you sell and how many people have you cultivated uh, into buying units that you can market or sell to in order to actually make that happen. If you have those numbers, if those numbers add up uh, where the math meets the math, so the math, the the cost of your product or service and the amount that you need to sell will reach the number that you want to have and you have enough people to sell it to, then you're good. If one of those numbers doesn't add up, then you've got to fix which one does not add up. So where my problem was, was I didn't have enough people to sell it to. So I thought, oh, I'm going to have to go out and get all these, you know, like, you know, thousands more people in order to have enough buying units to be able to sell to, or I could raise my price and sell to less people. Well, the easiest way for me to do it was to raise my price and sell it to less people. And that's how I, not only did I go over 50,000 a month, but that also took me over a million. It took me over 2 million. It took me to 5 million. It, it, that approach had has worked very well. But in the course of doing that, I also fixed the other problem, which was numbers coming in on the front end of people, which is more people to sell to. 
So that makes it more more resilient. You have a, a, there's a more resiliency when you when you have different options in your business. But a person really needs to look at the math and their belief system. Those two things, and if you get those two things adjusted correctly, you can make a quantum leap in your business in a very short period of time. Awesome. Thank you for explaining that so clearly. And one of my other questions for you that I think everyone would love to know more about is you did just mention quantum leaps. And I love the book, The Quantum Leap Strategy or whatever it's called. Um, uh, squared? Something squared. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> squared. And it's one of those. It's just such a powerful read for anyone listening. You squared. And at the same time, I know that you've been doing a lot of episodes on putting in the work and qualifying for the next level. You already mentioned to us that you spent seven years studying and you've been running your company for 20 years. I know that there's a lot of entrepreneurs coming up and they want to make a quantum leap. They want to turn their annual income into their monthly income. And at the same time, we both know that there's some work to be done. There's some diligent work, as you said, deliberate work to get to that place. And so can you talk a little bit about when maybe somebody is ready for a quantum leap versus when they might be just they might just need to put in the time and and take their time to build a foundation? Well, I yeah, I definitely think what you're saying is, is 100% accurate. Um I think anybody could make a quantum leap based on where they are. But what what the problem is, is like somebody will hear about my quantum leap or your quantum leap, and they'll want to make that quantum leap, but that's not where they are yet. So the first fundamental principle is to really understand where you are in your own personal growth. Because remember, it was an extraordinarily big deal for me for, to go from 20000 a year to 62000 a year. Today, I could do that in five minutes. That that would not be a big deal at all. We do that every day. So it's not, you know, that doesn't seem like any big deal anymore. But then it was a it was a huge deal. So a person has to look at where are they? Like, what is the most you've ever earned? And then what is your preparedness to be able to actually do that? And look at wh- what quantum leap do you, are you actually prepared for from a business standpoint um, or anything else that you're actually looking at? And that would be looking at what are your resources? What are your current resources? What is your skill set? What is your mindset around this? Do you think that you can actually do it? Is there evidence there um, that you believe in that you can do it? And that's where what you stops a lot of people because they really don't understand where they are in their personal growth. And what I mean by that is they don't understand what their subconscious block or stopping strategy actually is. So a person has to ask themselves a very, very serious question. What could happen in your life right now that would cause you to stop moving toward your goal or your dream? And you got to be, and even if it's for a day or two, you have to be brutally honest with yourself as to what that is. Could that be an illness, uh, somebody sick in your family, an argument with your spouse, um, a a number of uh, days going by where you don't make a sale, uh, somebody saying bad things about you, getting a ton of rejection, like, or or you not actually seeing how, you know, where the people are going to come from, where the client's going to come from, where's the money going to come from, where the resources going to come from. If all of those kind of things are blocks for a person, then they do not understand what they need to understand in order to make the quantum leap. Because what will happen is that your quantum leap will go as far as your mind will allow you to see, and it'll stop right there. And then you will create, you know, what's basically called a blind spot, which is you don't know why it stopped, but it's not moving forward and you can't identify what the cause is. And the cause starts with your own mindset. So there's two major things that a person needs to know. Number one, where are you going? And do you believe you can get there? And you have to really be able to see yourself receiving whatever that end result is. And the other thing is, where are you in your own growth and preparedness to be able to move forward? If I took you and I put you in a desert and I gave you a map and on the map was California And I said to you, here's a map, you're in the desert, walk to California. But I didn't orient you to the map. 
you could walk around forever. You could die in the desert and never find California. You have a tool that will allow you to get there, but you don't know how to use it because you don't know where you are. And that's the way a lot, the way a lot of people approach business and success. They don't understand where they are. So you've got to start studying and find out more about yourself. Like self-awareness is is huge. You need to know who you are, what your weak spots are, what your strengths are. Where do you need to improve in order to get where it is that you want to go? And what's unfortunate is so many people don't want to do that foundational work to get there. They just want to get there. And I think that the, the, they don't realize that really what's happening is fear is more in control of them at this point. Uh, they're afraid they'll never get there. They're afraid that they'll lose what they have. They're, they're afraid of something. But the, the idea is that more than getting to some place, because success really is not a destination at all. It's a, it's a journey. And what we need to understand about the journey is that if we do not enjoy the journey, We're never going to maintain the success because you're in the journey 99% of the time. That destination is something that is ethereal. It consistently moves. You know, if you you hit a goal this month, it's not the same next month. If your business is going to grow, it can't stay the same. And if any company that tries to stay the same will be out of business. So that's a constantly moving target. If, If you don't enjoy what you do every day, to make your business run and work and move forward, you're not going to be in business very long. Yeah, I've heard you say that many times. Uh, You gave the example recently of the actor or actress who spends much less time on set than they do looking for the next gig or promoting the movie or whatever it may be. And it's the same with us as business owners. You have to enjoy the process and find joy in the challenges and really the whole experience, not just always try and get to that destination. So thank you for that reminder. Yeah, you're welcome. So I just want to ask one more question before we wrap up. So I know one of your other um, tools for transforming your own life and helping your clients do the same is using the law of polarity. Can you just leave our listeners with some information about what the law of polarity is? And if they're struggling right now or wondering how to get from where they are today to that next level, how can they use it and apply it in their own life? Well, so here, so, so law polarity is is a very interesting tool to uh, both study, understand, and use um, in your life and in your business. And the idea with anything in life, really, what we should be searching for is the truth about something. When we understand the truth about it, it's very, very empowering. The law of polarity is is a tool that allows you to start to conceive the truth about anything that's in your life. I mean, it's a law that touches absolutely everything. So if we use it in the sense of money, the truth is actually abundance. But what people experience in their reality is either poverty, which is one side of the law of polarity, or wealth. Now, most people are somewhere in between those two extremes, But all those extremes do is basically explain the parameters of the truth about that law or about that thing, which is abundance. The universe is completely abundant. And because we have the ability to choose, we can live anywhere within the spectrum of abundance. We can live in an abundantly poverty or we can live abundantly wealthy or anywhere in between. We have the ability to choose where we're going to be on that on that scale based on that law. So if we understand the law, we also understand that the law of polarity is basically showing you the opposite sides of the same thing, which means that if I'm experiencing poverty or and and it doesn't even need to be like extreme poverty, if I'm not making enough in my life. I'm experiencing uh, a place that I would call my reality. I have uh, so much money in the bank, so much money coming in, or no money at all, a lot of debt, whatever it might be. The opposite side of that is true at the same time in the same place, meaning that if you don't have the money, the money is also there and it's there in great abundance. And 
we're only trained to see what we're trained to see. So if you're raised, if you're raised in a family where um, your um, your experience is your parents make say fifty thousand dollars a year, and you've never seen anybody make any more than that, you're not aware of how to make more than that. Then basically, your financial set point, your internal program on bringing in money is around fifty thousand dollars a year, and it might get a little better or a little worse, but basically, you'll stay around that point most of your life. If you make a mistake and you start to overspend and now $50,000 a year is not enough and you've got a ton of debt going on, uh, a lot of times you do what I did, which is try to double down on how much you're working to make a little bit more money to hopefully pay off the debt or you, you try to consolidate the debt or you try to negotiate the debt. Like People do all kinds of crazy things to try to change it, not understanding the law of polarity states that if you if you have that debt, the amount of money to pay it off exists at the same time. But if you don't, if you're not aware that it's there and you're not aware of what to do, then you're never going to bring it into your life. But in order to be aware of what to do, you have to first be aware that it's there. And that's what the law basically does. It lets you know from a knowledge, from a truth standpoint, that the opposite of anything you're experiencing also exists at the same time, in the same place, even if you can't see it, it's there. So when I work with clients privately, this is something that I put them through actual exercises, not just thinking about it, but they're given real things to do to prove that this exists in their life. And that's how they change their income around so fast. And then they all say the same thing. They say the same thing that I said, which is like, it can't be this easy. Like, you're freaking kidding me. I went through my whole life struggling like this and suffering and worrying, and it was actually this easy to earn money. And it's like, yeah, that's the truth. But you know what? The 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 We've been raised in a world where a lot of people don't know what the truth is, and there's a lot of people that don't want you to know what the truth is because then you can't be controlled. So it, it that law works for money. It works for people. It works for any resource. It works for good and bad. It works for everything. The idea is that if you study that law, you'll be aware of something that you're not experiencing in your reality, and then you start to figure out how to bring it into your life, and really quick. I love that. And your opportunity for turning, you know, going from the 20,000 up to the 62,000, that's a perfect example of that. It was right there. Right there. And it was just, you know, shifting your perspective to actually see it. Yeah, because most people... The reason they don't see the opportunity is because their mind is trained to see something that they don't want. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much, David. You're welcome. The final question that I always ask all of our guests is, can you leave our listeners with one way to create a life better than their dreams? Self-awareness. So it's all about self-awareness. The more you understand the truth about yourself the easier it is to create your dreams. I don't think anybody really creates their dreams until they find out the truth about themselves. And that is, and it's, I don't want to say that in an airy fairy way. It's very, very real. We're raised to believe what other people think about us, not what we think about us. So in order to do that, you've got to strip away all the beliefs that you carry that other people told you that you were and told you that the world was. And then find out what is it in your core and why are you here? When you do that, instantly the world changes right before your eyes and it becomes an amazing journey. Thank you. You're welcome. And for all the listeners, David is one of our incredible speakers at I Heart My Life Live in January 2020 in San Diego. And so we're going to be going deeper. David's going to be teaching from the stage. And as you can probably already see, being in that room is going to be transformational and will help you gain that self-awareness that you need to be able to go to the next level and get really clear about what may be blocking the millions that live within you. So thank you so much, David. So grateful for you and your time. My pleasure, Emily. Thank you for having me. It was a real honor. The event's going to be absolutely amazing. It is. And I just want to say once again, your podcast has changed my life. So can you tell our listeners a little bit more about where they can find you? Yeah, they can uh, basically at any podcast location on the internet, it's called the Successful Mind Podcast. So you go to podcast or you go to iTunes, whatever, the Successful Mind Podcast. That's what it is. Love it. All right, David. Thanks again. Wow. I hope you love that episode as much as I did. David is incredible. 
And if you want to learn more from David and really uncover what's stopping you from reaching your goals, he's the guy you go to when you realize the strategy is no longer cutting it. It's what's going on beneath the surface that you need to transform. And he's speaking live from the stage at our event, I Heart My Life Live in January 2020. Make sure you get your ticket at www.iheartmylifelive.com. He's going to be presenting on this topic, tapping into the millions within, how to break through financial blind spots. So you're going to want to be there. See you in San Diego. Thank you for listening to the I Heart My Life show. For more inspiration, success tips, and ways to achieve your life and business goals, definitely follow me on Facebook and Instagram on I Heart My Life Now. See you next time.